Hello folks and welcome back to a feature we haven't done in a very long time, which is the BitTech Modding Toolbox. So, of course, if you haven't seen a Modding Toolbox episode before, what is it? Basically, this is a segment where we look through a number of different tools that are really useful for modding. And that can range all the way from some of the more basic kit just for getting a job done or maybe getting into a field, or also for kitting out your workshop with more advanced kit just so that you can do a job consistently over and over with high repeatability and in a reliable manner. So today, as you've probably imagined, we're going to be taking a look at saws. So previously we've covered files, we've looked at uh, machine and hand polishing and sanding equipment. We've also covered drills, drill bits and all the related gubbins. Today we need to look at how we're going to be cutting panels and pieces to be able to put into our mods. And obviously we've got quite an array of equipment out on the bench, ranging from some of the pieces that I had from when I first started modding, all the way to some of the newer equipment that I've been using recently and you may have seen in some of the recent videos. So we're going to start from the basics with hand saws and explain some of the uses for the different ones that I've got over here, as well as why you might want to pick them up for different mods and different jobs that you might be thinking of doing. Now, it is worth mentioning, this is not an exhaustive list. There are loads of saws that I actually don't have. For instance, I don't have space for a band saw. I also don't have maybe a portable one or a sawzall because these aren't necessarily things that I do on a regular basis, so I haven't invested in them. If, however, you do that sort of work, definitely consider it. This is only the stuff that I've been using that I think is really helpful for modding. And again, some of it is going to be basic and some of it more advanced and more expensive later on as well. So kicking off with the hand tools, I think it's probably worth starting with this one over here because it's maybe not one that a lot of people would actually think to purchase quite early on. And this is a mitre saw. So the cool thing about this one is it helps get good angles on parts, be it 45 degrees, 90 and so on. And I actually got this for making flight cases. So if you remember our flight case video, basically you have a lot of aluminium extrusions and I wanted them to be nice and accurate and to be able to match in the corners with 45 degree angles. Now trying to do that freehand is exceptionally difficult so I got this saw to be able to work at home and it worked pretty well. I mean, you're always going to have issues with the accuracy with these hand saws, especially these ones, because they're not particularly expensive and kind of really thickly made, but you can clamp it down to a table and it does have the ability to make much more accurate cuts than if you were doing it at home. Now, the other handy thing is, of course, you could always use something like this if you're going to be doing rigid tubing. So if you've got acrylic tubing and you need to cut it with a saw, something like this will work very well. Alternatively, if you're doing brass or maybe stainless steel, you can also use one of these for that as well. Now, obviously, I've got a few other ones here as well. So we've got hacksaw. So specifically, if you're going to be doing lots of um, sort of tubing work, these are really useful, especially for acrylic because they've got quite fine teeth, so it's not going to grab a lot and it shouldn't cause any of your tubing to shatter. Just make sure you don't melt it accidentally because obviously if the acrylic gets very hot, then it can stick around the blade because the teeth are quite small. But if you're going to be doing metal tubes or you've got um, maybe a metal bar that you're using inside your PC or elsewhere, these are absolutely indispensable. And even with all my machine saws, I still use the hacksaw all the time. Now you've probably seen or have one of these already, um, but these are particularly good for working with um, say planks or just thicker lumber in general. Actually I mostly use this for garden work if I'm honest because a lot of the, the uh, purposes that I did have this for have been superseded by other saws that I've now got. But it is still handy having one because sometimes you can't use the machine saws in, in areas that are difficult to reach and other times you just want to keep the noise down so actually one of these works really quite well. But one of the saws that has superseded it in a lot of the work that I do with wood is one of these, which is a tenon saw. Now these are basically accurate saws for use in joinery. Uh, this one's made by Footprint. It's really well made, very hefty, has a good balance to it, and also has nice resharpenable blades. So it's worth investing in a good quality saw when you can, because actually even good quality saws aren't all that expensive. And having that really reliable cutting edge makes a big difference. Not to mention that the um, more expensive ones tend to have either serviceable blades or blades that are simply tempered and properly hardened more evenly and you can have better teeth I find. So I can get really good cuts in both hard and softwoods with one of these which is vital if you want to do a little bit of joinery because it's amazing how many things you can do with a handsaw and just a lot of time. So as long as you're consistent and if you've maybe got a good set of chisels or some sanding pads and things, you can do some fantastic work. I mean, there's people who've done the most incredible joinery with just a saw and a, a table with a clamp and things, just because they've spent the time that they need on such a project. Now, one of the other things that's really, really useful that I use 
again, on a very regular basis, is a coping saw. So the coping saw is really good for detailed work, especially if you're doing sheet metal. So you may recall we did a uh, MSI backplate a long, long time ago, and we did that on a scroll saw, but we also finished some of the details off by hand using a coping saw. So almost anything you can do on a scroll saw, you can use one of these for. The other advantage is that they're quite easy to uh, be very accurate with them just because you can take your time. There are also different varieties available. So this one has quite a serious bow to it. You can have ones which are not quite as bowed. You can also have jewel, like jeweler's saws, which are really long and they give you a huge amount of purchase and the ability to go around quite large pieces. The blades are interchangeable on these sides. So I've got quite a fine tooth one on at the moment. You can also get rounded ones, which are more like a, a rope. And those are really good if you're going to be doing very, very fine work, especially on softer metals. You'll typically find that's more used for um, jewelry work, but if your project demands it, they can be really flexible. Now, of course, there are plenty of other hand saws around. I've only got a small selection over here, uh, but these are the ones that I find are really useful. And if you're just getting into modding or just starting out this sort of DIY making, these are a really good place to start because a coping saw like this can be had for maybe 15, 20 pounds on Amazon for a pretty decent quality one. This was about 25 pounds. Again, the same for this um, Irwin saw here. I think it was about 70 pounds for the um, tenon saw, but then you can get a different branded one and they're less as well. So these are a really affordable way of getting into uh, just cutting your panels in general, and uh, they'll offer a lot more control than using something like a rotary tool in some aspects. Right, so I thought it'd be a good idea to look first at the handheld power saws. So namely, these two, which I use the most, which are my jigsaws. So jigsaws are really good for doing uh, freehand cutting of panels. And that's really handy for when you're working with cases. So if you maybe want to have um, like a sheet steel case and you want to cut out space for a radiator, or you want to replace a panel with something else, maybe like a distro plate or similar, uh, I found the best way to cut through them is using a jigsaw with a metal cutting blade. So these can go through sheet steel like butter. I mean, seriously, it is so easy, especially if you have a cordless one. So there's always going to be a bit of a play between having corded and cordless. Personally, I like cordless just because it gives me that extra bit of maneuverability. So being able to go around corners a bit more easily without a cable trailing behind is actually really quite handy, especially if you're working in more confined spaces. Obviously, the trade-off is you maybe lose a little bit of top-end power, and also you have to be careful that you don't run out of battery mid-cut, because actually, if you start to lose power and you get a bit slower, you run the risk of having the blade catching on the metal, which can also warp it. So you want to make sure your blade's always going nice and fast, otherwise it won't cut properly. So be careful about that. So the way I get around it is I have basically a bunch of different batteries, and as soon as this one runs out, I pop in a new one, I take the other one, put it on the charger, which I've got mounted on the wall over there behind me, and that means I've always got one to hand that's fully charged up. And actually, if you've got three batteries, even two will work fine, but three gives you that extra bit of leeway. You should be fine, and you can cut using one of these like all day, basically, and you won't have a trouble. The other handy thing is that nowadays, batteries are much more capacious. So these ones are 4.2 amp hour. Um, these ones are newer, and this is 5.2 amp hour. They go all the way to eight for some brands. So just make sure to have a look and get a good one as well. So. This DeWalt is quite a good starting point because without the batteries, it's about 120 pounds or so. You want to have one which is going to be nice and reliable, has good power and the ability to be able to cut through as many materials as you want. So I can use these for basically everything that I work with. So maybe 20 to 30 millimeter thick uh, MDF, fairly thick aluminium up to 10 millimeters. Uh, I can also go through, of course, all the acrylics and things like that. So these work very well for me for those uses. And the ability to do some um, hand, uh, freehand kind of work is also really handy. If you're going to be cutting around corners, you just want to rough it out just so you can do it later on, or maybe you're going to be sanding it down and uh, prepping a really good edge later. These really help for that. The only thing is that you've got to be careful about the different features because you're going to be buying into a system, basically, if you're going to be using cordless tools. So the old system that I had was the DeWalt, and they've got batteries that swap between all the different products. The problem is I can't use these batteries on my festival products, so you sort of end up stuck in one ecosystem. So it's best having a look at what you're likely going to be using and buy the system which is going to work best with the tool you use the most. So for instance, Makita has a really, really wide range and if you're going to be doing lots of things with saws, actually Makita is quite a good option because a lot of their other tools are more affordable. 
Uh, if you go to the very top end, you've got uh, brands like Hilti and uh, Maffel and so on, very much tradesman tools. Um, the Festool ones are, I find, really quite nice. I've really enjoyed using them, uh, but it's mostly the dust extractor one that I love. So I've got a Festool dust extractor and I use it with the CNC machine and also a lot of the other tools around. And I find that because I've also got a very small workshop, dust can get everywhere. So I've got these specifically because they do a really good job of dust extraction. And the Festool batteries now have a Bluetooth option, and I've got a Bluetooth uh, thing for my uh, extractor so that I can use the hose handle. Basically, it means I can have the tools automatically operate with the extractor, and I don't have to go back and forth and plug things in and out when I want to have good dust extraction, which is really good for when you're working with materials like MDF, because that dust gets everywhere. It's really fine and fibrous, and even just regular woods can have that same problem. Dust extraction is really important if you have the space for it, and I thoroughly recommend looking at which options are available. Because this DeWalt one that I've got here doesn't really have much of a, an emphasis at all on dust extraction. And actually, I found one of the problems with it is that sometimes the dust can accumulate in front of the cutting blade, which makes it quite difficult to see exactly what I'm doing. And this doesn't really have many options for sliding in new guards and things. So this Festool one not only has a light in the front so I can see exactly what I'm cutting, but it has this little plastic tab and that slides into the bottom here in front of the tool, keeps it free from dust and allows you to see exactly what you're doing. Similarly, on the, around the back, I've got proper dust extraction. Now you should be able to find this on a lot of the newer tools. Uh, it's become much more popular recently, but definitely keep an eye out for that. And you want to make sure that you're going to be having um, a good ecosystem that you can work with for as long as possible. One of the things that you need to be mindful with these is your blade. So you need to match your blade to the material that you're cutting. Now the good thing about jigsaws is actually the blades are really cheap, even if you get quite good quality ones. So I can get packs of these for about 10 pounds on Amazon, and they can come, these ones are designed for metal work. You get wood specific blades as well, acrylics, uh, different plastics and so on. So you can just match them to the material you're using, and you can usually get them available locally. So if you say break one or it gets, um, uh, bent and uh, it's gone blunt. You can usually just pop around the corner somewhere if you're near to a hardware store and you can buy something that's going to do a good job. Now as much as I love my jigsaws to bits, they do come with a number of limitations, uh, especially in that they're not particularly good for cutting very long accurate panels. So to get around that I use a circular saw, specifically a track saw. So in keeping with the ecosystem thing, I've got one cordless one here, which came from the uh, DeWalt XR system. Uh, this is actually, I don't use it a lot in my workshop. I used to use it a fair bit when I did a lot of panel work uh, before I got the track saw. But the problem with it, of course, is it doesn't come with a track and you can't actually fit this particular model to one. Uh, they might do now, so if you have a newer one, maybe it will fit, but this one doesn't. It does allow you to do mitre angles and uh, chamfers and things like that, but it is a little bit limited. That said, being completely cordless means I can use it outside. And actually, I've used it to cut railway sleepers in the past uh, for the garden and things. You can cut it and then move it around. And having that extra mobility to be able to take it out with you is really convenient because sometimes you're nowhere near a power cord. The only problem is that these saws absolutely juice your batteries. So make sure you have plenty to hand. I can only get a few minutes of use out of these uh, full power. It's usually enough to cut most of the things I need, but you need to have batteries going constantly and then of course, if you need to charge up your batteries, you know a power socket anyway, in which case maybe you want to have a corded saw. It just makes sense. But for most of the panel work that I do nowadays, I use one of these, which is a track saw. So the appeal of this one is this is a plunged track saw. So I can plunge into the material at an accurate depth using the gauge here on the side. And that means not only can I cut uh, very shallow or deep ones, I can be very accurate because this one basically interfaces with my whole sort of festal ecosystem that I've got going here. So this table, for instance, has all the clamps and uh, parts that can fit into a mitre system that they sell, and that then attaches directly to this saw. So you may have seen it in some of the previous uh, videos where I'm using it sort of essentially for the same purpose as a table saw. I don't really have the space here for a table saw because even if you can fit the saw itself, you need to move a panel left and right and you need a lot of, basically you just need a lot of room. Whereas it's much easier for me to move the saw rather than to move the piece of wood. Or in this case, most of the time I'm working with acrylic. So when I buy acrylic for the CNC machine, I tend to buy it in larger sheets and then cut it down to size to reduce waste. I basically plonk the acrylic on the table, set up the track so that I cut the exact portion that I want, put the saw onto the track, and then I can get a really accurate straight cut. 
The handy thing is that this has a proper dust extraction system built into it. That means I'm not going to be covering the whole workshop in MDF dust when I'm cutting uh, large panels of boxes. And I'm also not going to be putting uh, acrylic all over the place and getting it stuck inside the blade, for instance, which is a worry when you're using one of these ones because acrylic becomes like a sort of a string. And when a lot of it kind of bunches together, it can basically form like a solid lump, which gets in the way of the blade and also could maybe get in the way of your cut, which can be dangerous. This one has full protection and actually it works really well for my uses. Of course, you can always go higher end. You've got things like Maffle who specialize in these kind of work type saws. Uh, same with Hilti, very kind of high end, reliable stuff. But then on the lower end, you can still get really good results from something like Ryobi, Akita, Bosch. Bosch does some very good corded um, jigsaws, for instance. You can get some fantastic value out of those. So definitely shop around, however, think about your ecosystem and how you're going to be using it in the future. I use this mostly for acrylic, but it works fantastic for aluminium as well. And of course, all the usual woods and similar. Now, at last we come to the larger table mounted options. So I've got my compound mitre saw over here and my scroll saw. Now you've probably seen me use the scroll saw quite a lot in the past, and that's because it is an incredibly handy piece of kit to have. And they're also not that expensive. So this Shepak that I've got is quite a good entry level system, and you can find quite a few others on Amazon that are well rated. Um, but I like this one because it's well supported and it's uh, certainly got a whole load of features. It's even got like a rotary tool built in, but it sort of lacks power, so I don't bother using that. I'd rather use something proper like the Fordham. The handy thing about this one is that it allows you to get into areas in a much more sort of controlled manner um, for doing intricate work. So if you want to carve out a shape maybe for a back plate or you're trying to make like a special mounting plate um, or even just make panels to uh, clad a system in, these are really good. And I used to use this before I had the CNC machine. If I wanted to have panels really accurate, I could print off a te paper template and then I would basically just use my sc scroll saw to cut out the template and then file them down to be uh, as close to the line as possible. And I found you can get a very accurate cut by doing that simple method. In fact, a lot, it's a method that uh, a lot of clock makers, so if any of you know ClickSpring on YouTube, if you don't, I definitely suggest looking him up because his videos are fantastic. He uses a scroll saw for tons of roughing work and he'll basically finish it up with, with needle files to get an incredibly accurate part that can be used in clocks and similar. When we're making PC mods, this works particularly well. And the other thing that I like using it for is tubing. So you may have seen also when I do acrylic tubing, because I can't use a pipe cutter, I have to use a saw. And actually this one works very well. The small teeth mean it's, uh, it doesn't grab the acrylic, um, but it's also quick enough that it doesn't melt it, especially if I combine it with my belt sander. That's how I can uh, trim tubes to length very, very quickly. And it's a really easy way to do the tubes because it cuts it so fast and they're quite quiet. So scroll saws themselves aren't very loud pieces of kit. My saw is very, very loud. You have to wear proper ear protection when you're using it, as I found out once. The um, scroll saw, though, can be run all different times of the day. It's not going to be an issue in different rooms. And I'd say it's just such a versatile piece of kit. If you want to do any kind of intricate work, I would definitely consider using one. That said, there are a few things you have to consider if you want to pick one of these up. So firstly, you want to make sure that you've got one which just has a decent throat size. So that's the distance here from the back of the machine all the way to the tip of the blade. So obviously, if you have a larger distance here, it allows you to rotate larger panels. And this is quite a good distance, but you will find that sometimes you won't be able to get, say, a longer panel past this neck. So you, it's worth having a think how big the pieces that you're likely to, you know, going to be cutting are. A lot of the time you're doing smaller work, though, so it's not going to be that much of a problem. The other thing that's worth considering is the type of mechanism that it uses to attach the blades, because there are two different main types. So this one uses like a peg system. So the blades themselves have a little peg that goes through the top and the bottom, and then you can simply take those, put them into the top and into the bottom here, screws it at the back using this uh, tension screw. And it's very quick, very simple. There is an issue, the pins are quite wide. So actually what you'll find is that the pins are often wider than the blade themselves, which can hamper you if you're doing detailed work, because if your part is much smaller than say a five millimeter hole, which is what you generally need to get the pins through apart, it's not so good in those particular circumstances because you can't physically get the pins through. But if you want to do super detailed work, I would recommend getting one which has a smaller clamping system on the blade instead. That way you can use much finer jewelry type blades and it will clamp onto the blade directly. The issue is it's a little bit slower, but if you're going to be doing intricate work, 
that should be the priority rather than just the speed of how many blades you can swap out in any given time frame. Now, the miter saw here is also a really useful piece of kit, especially if you're going to be doing lots of aluminium extrusion work. So maybe you're going to be making uh, your own chassis and you want to use aluminium extrusions or uh, things like that. This is particularly good and I use it a lot for both making crates, so you know, wooden pieces that need to go inside the framework of a crate, also for making flight cases out of aluminium extrusion as I mentioned. So you can get a really accurate cut by using one of these saws and a very consistent cut as well. So the best thing about them is the fact that you can obviously change the angle of the saw much like with the hand one but then it takes the pressure out of having to do it exactly the same way and your arm gets very very tired doing it by hand doing it consistently with a machine makes things much easier but again it's worth considering the kinds of blades that you're going to have available and the costs involved with those so because i do a lot of metal cutting i have to get uh, slightly different blades because most of them are designed with a different kerf size for wood so you don't really want to be using a blade that's uh, specific for wood on one that's more designed for metal. And it's also worth considering that most of these saws aren't suitable for work with uh, ferrous material. So you don't really want to be cutting steel, iron, that sort of thing on one of these saws generally. Some of them can, but this one here that I've got, this DeWalt one, can't unfortunately. Now one thing that I didn't really expect um, when I got this saw actually was just how much space. Now, you can imagine this is quite a big piece of kit, but the thing that I didn't really anticipate was the fact that it also needs a lot of depth. So different soils on the market handle this differently. So if we take a look at the compound and we move it, so this makes it a little bit more visible, you can move the saw forwards and then all the way backwards. And this gives you a large sort of reach that you can um, uh, use larger planks with, for instance, but in the case of this particular saw, it has these bars that move around the back. And actually, if I place this too close to a wall, what I find is if I retract the saw all the way to the back, then those bars hit my wall. So I actually have to move the saw entirely onto either the very front and balance it off the edge of my shelf, or I have to move it onto a separate table and then clamp it down there instead. It, it, it works, but quite frankly, I'd much rather have a different design uh, where the bars themselves are fixed and the saw head moves. So I know that the Festival one works that way, so it's one of the ones I've been previously looking at, um, and I'm sure a few others do as well. So just bear that in mind uh, if you plan on putting this in a more confined space. Now, another thing that is 100% something you should be considering when you've got these kind of saws, if you're using one indoors, you want to have a dust extraction system. Now, most of them have a uh, system sort of built in to capture dust, so this one has a big nozzle around the back for use with the uh, DeWalt extractors. I just use an adapter and then I can fit my Festool one just fine. Um, if you don't use one, stuff gets absolutely everywhere. Because you can imagine the cutting rate of one of these is pretty high. So if you're cutting aluminium, the chips get absolutely everywhere. If you're cutting wood, it flies around and you probably want to make sure that you're uh, wearing a proper ventilator mask and anything else to prevent you from breathing that dust in. So definitely consider that don't 100% need it and if you're using it outside then you'll be fine but if you're using it in a confined space I would definitely recommend considering your dust extraction very heavily because it could come back to bite you later on. Well folks I hope you found that information helpful as I mentioned at the beginning of the video this is not an exhaustive list there are loads of different ways to approach different problems uh, and this is just a few of the ways that I do it and again some of these tools aren't even ideal I maybe made decisions when I first purchased them that maybe I shouldn't have done uh, or I've bought tools that maybe don't fit the use cases that I have right now but that's all part of the experience I'm just hoping that uh, the fact that I've shown you these things maybe means that you can make some more informed decisions with your own purchases in the future. Of course, we'd love to hear from you if you've got any points and if you have any kit you'd like to share for yourself, make sure to pop the links over in our Discord server because we have a lot of good discussion over there. You can also find us over on builds.gg, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. I'll catch you next time, folks.